out on this computer. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to another session of Thoracic Gurus. Uh, it's uh, really been a great uh, few weeks uh, in terms of academic uh, uh, knowledge that we have all gained. Uh, and today, it's really my honor and privilege to introduce to you uh, Professor Akif Turner. Professor Akif Turner is one of the leading authorities in lung cancer management across the world. He is on the committee for International Society for Lung Cancer, and he, 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 his understanding of the staging of lung cancer is second to none, uh, really around the world. And all of us take advice from Akif whenever we, we have difficult questions to answer. So Professor Turner, uh, the floor is all yours. Uh, let me tell, let me introduce the audience to you. These are uh, people who are logging in from across the world. Uh, we have uh, uh, exam going students, we have young residents, we have surgeons, we have onco surgeons and uh, senior uh, surgeons as well. So it's a wide variety of people who have logged in and uh, they are looking forward to hear your uh, talk. And also it's live on YouTube and we've got a big number of people logged in on YouTube as well. The floor is all yours, Professor Tuna, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for the opportunity to talk about uh, staging, uh, non small cell lung cancer. Hi everyone, I hope you are, you, uh, you are staying well uh, and healthy during these difficult times. Uh, I'd like to start with this slide, uh, which shows the importance of lung cancer. Actually, uh, when, you, uh, when we look at the cancer statistics uh, uh, in, for the United States of America, uh, these are the numbers that are expected uh, in 2019. Prostate tumor is the uh, most frequent tumor among males and breast tumor is the most uh, frequently seen diagnosed tumor among women. But when we uh, examine the, uh, the death, death rates, the mortality, uh, it is uh, uh, easy to, uh, to see that uh, <clears throat> lung tumor uh, is the number one tumor that causes most mortality in, in the world. Again, uh, among women, uh, lung tumor is number one tumor it, that causes most uh, uh, deaths uh, from cancers. So it is true for, uh, of course, West uh, countries uh, like United States and uh, the countries in Europe. And it is also true, uh, as far as we know, it is true for the Asian countries. Uh, only uh, there are small number of uh, countries uh, in which the tumor, the lung tumor is seventh or eighth, uh, uh, number eight uh, 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 cause of death, which are the countries uh, below uh, uh, the, uh, the Saharan des desert. So sub-Saharan, it is not true for sub-Saharan uh, countries, but uh, there are few. So uh, memory, let's uh, start with the mammary carcinoma and the death rate and the mortality rate of mammary carcinoma. Uh, approximately uh, 60 uh, out of 100 uh, women who had mammary carcinoma can uh, live uh, beyond 10 years. Uh, it's about 60% for all uh, stages. But uh, there, is a, there, is, there is a different story about uh, lung cancer. As you see here, only 7% of uh, patients can survive beyond 10 years. So there is a big difference between breast cancer and lung cancer. And uh, it, uh, it is uh, suffice it to say that uh, lung cancer, it is very uh, easy to understand actually why lung cancer is the number one uh, mortality cause in, in among women, even the fact that breast cancer is the most frequent one. But there is good news uh, uh, actually that uh, the uh, more the survival uh, of lung cancer has been increased uh, during last three decades. As you see here, uh, five-year survival rate uh, used to be 12 during 1970s. It increased to uh, 13 and uh, in during 1980s and increased to uh, uh, almost 20 for almost 
all, uh, of course, uh, stages. Uh, this is good news, but uh, as you uh, see here, it is one of the, uh, uh, the worst uh, uh, cancers in terms of survival. It is even equal to liver and intrahepatic bile duct cancer. So, of course, uh, today, uh, this evening, we are looking at, we will be looking at TNM stage, TNM as staging uh, parameters. But in fact, uh, uh, there are many factors that determine uh, survival. Uh, there are tumoral factors, uh, including TNM, histopathological factors, but also uh, there are environmental factors that determine uh, survival of the patient. And also patient factors, patients, host factors are important, of course. Immunity is uh, one of the most important uh, parameters that uh, determines the survival. But as surgeons, uh, it is very, very difficult to to analyze other factors like environmental factors and patient factors. And as surgeons, we are fixated to look at TNM factors as uh, the most important factors. But it, uh, these factors can define only 60% of, uh, 60 60 of the patients uh, and the, it uh, only the sensitivity is uh, about 80% uh, for TNM, uh, but we have to use TNM because uh, uh, these factors can be uh, defined clinically uh, and radiologically. So what is TNM stage? What is stage? Actually, it is a function. Akif, Akif, Akif. Yes. I just, sorry yes. to stop you. I just yes. allowed you to share your video. So can you switch on okay. your video, please? I, I just found sure. where that link was. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, fantastic. Can you please. see me? Right. Yeah, we can see you now. Thank you very much, Akif. Sorry, okay. please continue. Thank you. Okay. What is stage? Stage is a function of three parameters, actually, namely T and M. T stands for, of course, tumor. N uh, is used for nodule, uh, uh, nod nodular metastasis. And M stands for uh, uh, distant metastasis or intrathoracic metastasis. So, uh, should we use only one uh, type of TNM? The answer is no. There are uh, at least three types of TNM. Actually, uh, there are uh, six types of TNM, but uh, only three of them are useful in terms of uh, uh, clinical factors and ra radiological de definitions. Uh, clinical staging, uh, 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 clinical staging. Uh, is constructed by the radiological examinations and the clinical examinations. So when we talk about clinical staging, staging it means that we uh, reconstruct the uh, staging uh, uh, looking at the radiological findings and the clinical findings, uh, such as bronchological findings and other uh, findings uh, that can be obtained from uh, biochemistry or other uh, assessments. So surgical pathological staging is more accurate staging compared to clinical staging because uh, it stands for the uh, uh, staging uh, after uh, resectional surgery. So after uh, pathological examination, uh, the TNM staging becomes more and more accurate uh, and uh, overstatement or understatement becomes more less and less frequent. Restaging uh, after initial treatment, uh, uh, is the, the acronym for that is YTNM. For example, if you, if you uh, send the patient to neoadjuvant therapy and if you restage the patient after neoadjuvant therapy, neoadjuvant chemotherapy or chemoradiotherapy, uh, we should name it as, it, it as uh, Y-TNM, as rest stage TNM. So what is the uh, importance of T-factor? T-factor is very important, actually. Uh, when we look at these uh, survival curves, when we look at the patients without nodal, and, uh, nodal metastasis uh, and uh, 
uh, distant metastasis. The uh, five-year survival of the patients with T1A is 92%. It means that almost all patients can be cured when the tumor is T1A. But uh, for T2B, uh, it's very different. Only half of the patients can survive beyond t uh, five years. So uh, key factor is very decisive factor. Uh, of course, N and M factors are important, but T factor uh, is very decisive and it can be uh, 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 found or it can be obtained by radiological examinations. So let, let's look at T descriptors. Uh, according to eight TNM staging, uh, small tumors uh, are named as T1A, small tumors up to one centimeter. Uh, between one and two centimeter, it is called T1B. Between two and three centimeter, it, is, it should be sta staged as T1C, as a T staging. Uh, and it continues. The, every uh, centimeter counts in terms of T factor. Three to four centimeter, it is 2 to A. 2 TB, 2, 2, uh, T2B means uh, the tumor is between four and five centimeter. If the tumor is larger than five centimeter but smaller than seven centimeter, the T factor is three. And if the tumor is larger than seven centimeter, it should be staged as T4. So this is survival rates according to uh, T factor at Jarrah Pasha. As you see, these, these are very, uh, these, these curves are similar uh, to, to those uh, uh, obtained by uh, International Association of Lung Cancer Society. So how can we evaluate the T factor? Of course, chest X-ray is the simplest method and should be the first method to evaluate the T factor, but the sensitivity and specificity are very low uh, when we use only chest X-ray. So we use CT scan uh, and PET CT uh, for the evaluation of T factor before operation or before any uh, definitive treatment. Mag magnetic resonance imaging uh, is used, but in very a small number of patients, very select patients, it is useful for spherosalcus tumors, vertebral diaphragmatic invasion. It can, it shouldn't be used. The uh, the frequent, uh, sorry. The frequent, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is used sometimes for uh, the invasion to mediastinal uh, structures, but usually uh, it ex exaggerates uh, the mediastinal invasion. So it shouldn't be used, used usually for mediastinal uh, invasion. So what can we see uh, when we look at chest X-ray, CT, and PET CT. Of course, as I uh, uh, told you, uh, chest X-ray is informative, but sensitivity is and uh, the uh, specificity are uh, very low, very suboptimal. Uh, but uh, as you see here, it, uh, uh, the uh, the borders uh, and the the density. Uh, 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 can be predicted when we look at chest X-ray. Uh, chest PET CT shows the uh, the border uh, very clearly, and also the metabolic activity, which is a suggestive uh, parameter for a, a presence of tumor. So just look at T factors one by one uh, by examples. Uh, the left of the a slide shows the tumor, uh, a T1A tumor, uh, which is smaller than uh, one centimeter, as you see here. There is a right lower lobe tumor, uh, which is T1B, between one centimeter and two centimeter in diameter. Uh, T1C means the tumor is greater than two centimeter, but smaller than three centimeter. So this shows a tumor, uh, uh, T1C tumor, uh, which is 2.5 centimeter in diameter. And uh, you see the uh, 
positivity, FDG positivity, uh, and it is uh, about uh, five. Uh, SUE uh, value uh, is five, uh, which means it is a uh, very high, highly suggestive of tumor. So the uh, picture is not uh, uh, too beautiful as the uh, uh, as the, the it is the well, uh, as the T1 tumors. Let's look at the T2 tumor. T2A tumor means the tumor is between three and four centimeter, as you see here. If the tumor uh, is invading visceral pleura, it is called T2A again. Uh, if the tumor is larger than four centimeter but smaller uh, or than five centimeter or equal to five centimeter, it should be staged as uh, two, T2B. Uh, According to seventh staging uh, system, uh, if the tumor uh, caused uh, total atelectasis, it was uh, staged as T3. But uh, according to this in, in new staging system, which is the eighth staging system, if the tumor is associated with atelectasis or pneumonitis, it, is, it should be staged as T2A. If the tumor is smaller than four centimeter, it should be uh, staged as Q2A. If the lesion is larger than four centimeter, but smaller than five centimeter, it should be staged as T2B. Uh, this, is, this shows a uh, T2B tumor, as you see here. It's about 4.5 centimeter in diameter. It is a, a right upper lobe tumor. This is, uh, again, a T2B tumor. Uh, it is five centimeter in diameter. Uh, as you see here, the border is irregular. And again, it is a uh, hyalur tumor, which is T2B. Uh, according to sta seventh staging system, if the tumor invades the main bronco, bronchus, uh, it used to be called as or named as T3. But uh, according to new staging system, it should be T2A or T2B, uh, depending on the size. So this is a specimen showing a T2B tumor. So this shows a, a tumor causing a right, left upper lobe atelectasis. Uh, in this uh, sections, uh, we, it is not possible to see the tumor uh, because it obstructs the left upper lobe uh, bronchus totally. But we see here is uh, the uh, totally uh, atelectatic uh, left upper lobe and air bronchogram. So uh, this shows, uh, this slide shows uh, uh, some examples of T3 tumor. If the tumor is larger than five centimeter but smaller than seven centimeter, it should be uh, named as uh, or stated as T3. Uh, if the tumor is invading chest wall, it, uh, it is T3 tumor. If the tumor is invading parietal pleura, it should be stated as T3. And if there are separate tumor nodules in the, uh, uh, the, the lobe in which the t primary tumor is, it should be again staged as T3. If the tumor is invading or uh, uh, abutting the phrenic nerve or per per parietal pericardium, again, it is T3 tumor. Uh, uh, there is a, a, a small difference between actually T3 tumor and T2 tumor. If the tumor invades, as you see here, uh, the parietal pleura, it transgresses the parietal pleura with uh, visceral pleura, it should be uh, state as T3, PL3 and PL2 tumors should be uh, staged as T3. This tumor uh, is invading the elastic layer of the visceral pleura and this tumor, as you see here, invading the visceral pleura as well as the parietal pleura. But T PL1 is not a T3 tumor. So this uh, slide shows the uh, a tumor, uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, patients. 
who had a, a left-sided tumor in, uh, abutting and invading the, the, the chest wall, as you see here, just around uh, vertebra. So again, this is a chest wall tumor, uh, yeah. T3 tumor, invading more than three uh, ribs. Again, this shows a, a T3 tumor. Actually, uh, the sensitivity of uh, uh, radi uh, radiological or CT is not so high. It's about 85% uh, in order to show the uh, T3 tumor. But chest wall pain is uh, more sensitive than uh, CT. And also, if you have a, a next generation uh, CT machine, uh, that takes a one millimeter uh, thickness uh, chest CT, it's again uh, more and more uh, sensitive for T3 uh, involvement. So what are, the, what are the T4 tumors? If the tumor invades main structures, such as trachea, carina, aorta, esophagus, or vertebra, this tumor should be staged as T4. Uh, this is the, actually the, uh, some of the uh, T4 tumors are operable, uh, uh, such as the tumor invading trachea, carina, and vertebra. Uh, technically, of course, the tumor invading aorta can be uh, resected with some aortic surgery. And also, it is possible to resect uh, esophagus with uh, tumor and of, or also with the lung, uh, adjacent lung. But uh, these uh, uh, operations are not recommended because of the survival, cure, survival rates. So this tumor uh, is invading uh, uh, diaphragm. The diaphragmatic invasion became T4 uh, for, your, uh, for the eight staging system. Uh, Corinal involvement is again T4. It should be named as T4. You see here, there is a tumor uh, invading main bronchus and also the corina. Uh, it also actually invades left main bronchus. We perform uh, uh, sleeve corinal resection to this patient. When I cover superior involvement is again uh, another type of T4 tumor. And sometimes the tumor invades when I cover superior as well as mediastinum. As you see here, this is a T4 tumor. The question is, which tumors, which T4 tumors are operable? Which, uh, which, which tumors should we, which tumors should we operate, operate on? Of course, uh, as thoracic surgeons with a large or giant ego, uh, the question, the answer would be to this question, if I can resect the tumor, uh, the tumor uh, should be named as uh, or deemed as resectable. But we have also, always uh, to look at the survival curves. And we have to ask ourselves if uh, the resection is uh, beneficial for the patient. We have to ask this question because there are more than two other two options uh, for the, uh, uh, the treatment of the uh, uh, lung cancer, which are radiotherapy, chemotherapy. And uh, when we uh, consider the last two decades, uh, we have to consider uh, targeted therapies and immunotherapies. So if we cannot op uh, uh, obtain more than 30% of five-year survival, uh, I think we shouldn't operate the patient because other uh, uh, modalities uh, can provide uh, approximately 30, 25 or 30% 30 of five-year survival. But when we look at this uh, nice uh, uh, survival curves uh, from the study uh, which was published from the, uh, the, the uh, thoracic surgeons 
in Paris, uh, uh, Dertovel's uh, uh, team. Uh, the survival, five-year survival of, of the patients with superior sulcus tumors, coronal invasion, superior vena cava invasion, or mediastinal invasion are about 35%, even for some patients, 60%. So uh, it is okay to operate the patients with uh, T4 tumors, but these uh, patients should have uh, N0, uh, means uh, no nodal metastasis and no distant metastasis. Let's look at the N factor, which is one, uh, which is a very important uh, parameter or component of TNM staging. So. Uh, Nx means lymph nodes cannot be assessed. N0 defines the situation in which there is no lymph nodes involved. N1 means there is a metastasis to the ipsilateral or peribronchial or ipsilateral hilar lymph nodes. N2 means that there is metastasis to ipsilateral mediastinal or subcranial lymph nodes. N3 means that uh, there is a metastasis of, of ipsilateral supraclavicular lymph nodes or ipsilateral scalene lymph nodes or contralateral lymph nodes, hilar or mediastinal lymph nodes. Uh, N factor is actually more important than the uh, T factor in, in terms of survival prediction because as you see here, N0 patients, of course, these are all T factors here, T1 to T4, and all N0 patients, uh, five-year survival uh, is about 37%, while N1 patients can, uh, only quarter of N1 patients can live beyond five years, and it is about 7% for N2 and N3 patients. It means that these are the uh, patients uh, that we should operate on. At N2 and N3 patients uh, that are uh, found to have a, a nodal invasion before the operations should be referred to oncological therapy. Of course, uh, there is neoadjuvant therapy and uh, some of the patients uh, uh, are uh, candidates for neoadjuvant therapy and multimodal therapy, including surgery. Uh, what are the mediastinal hilar in, in, uh, intrapulmonary leaf nodes? From one to nine, these are mediastinal leaf nodes. Basically, uh, fundamentally, these are the, this is the uh, media, medial mediastinum, as you see here, middle mediastinum. Uh, these are the supraclavicular, the highest mediastinal leaf nodes. They are usually not uh, dissected. Upper paratracheal leaf nodes, lower paratracheal leaf nodes for uh, subcranial lymph nodes, uh, five and six around uh, and beyond beyond the uh, the, the aorta, uh, paraesophageal lymph nodes number eight and inferior ligament lymph nodes number nine, and from number ten to number fourteen, these are uh, named as N1 lymph nodes, uh, hilar lymph nodes and intrapulmonary lymph nodes. In uh, 11 is interlobal, 12 is lobal, 13 is segmental, 14 is subsegmental lymph nodes. Uh, we can, as thoracic surgeons, we can sample or dissect 10, 11, or 12 uh, uh, nodes, but 13 and 14, the number for 13 and number 14, usually are dissected by pathologists during the specimen evaluation. So uh, this is more clear, uh, uh, but less realistic picture. As you see, there are many uh, sites for one station. For example, this, uh, this depicts, this shows the, uh, at least five locations for the uh, lower mediastinal leaf nodes. If the, the leaf node, if the leaf node uh, is proximal to uh, main bronchi, as you see here, and if it is uh, uh, inferior to, to uh, brachiocephalic vein, it should be named as number, uh, right paratracheal lymph node. Bel below the uh, aortic arcus, as you see here, it is uh, named as lower left paratracheal lymph node. And 
uh, above the uh, brachiocephalic vein, each, these lymph nodes are named as upper paratracheal lymph nodes, uh, right and left para upper paratracheal lymph nodes. Uh, there are articopulmonary lymph nodes, uh, which are uh, numbered as uh, number five, and periartic or anterior mediastinal lymph nodes, which are, which are numbered as uh, number six. So these lymph nodes, number five and number six lymph nodes, are, as you know, specific for left-sided left-sided tumors. It is very, very rare, almost uh, near to 0% to see uh, articopulmonary or subartic lymph node positivity seen in a patient with right-sided tumor. So if the lymph node is on the main bronchi, bronchi it is named, numbered as number 10. And after the, uh, the first branching, as you see here, after the, uh, this branching and this takeoff, it should be uh, numbered as uh, number 11 and so on. These are the examples of N0, N1 and, uh, patients. The, this patient, this uh, hypothetical patient, uh, has a uh, right lower lobe tumor, but there is no metastasis in the intrapulmonary lymph nodes or, or hyalur lymph nodes. It, it, it is it should be uh, staged as, as uh, N0. This is N1 patient, as you see here. Uh, there is a tumor, left lower lobe tumor, and there is lymph node metastasis around hilum, as you see here, uh, hilar lymph nodes. Uh, it doesn't matter if there is one or there are two or three lymph node metastasis around the main bronchus or lo lower bronchus. Uh, this slide uh, shows two uh, examples of N2 uh, tumors. So this is a right upper lobe tumor with uh, right par lower paratracheal lymph nodes positivity. And again, this, there is a, a left lower lobe tumor with higher positivity and also left lower paratracheal lymph node positivity, which means N2. So this slide shows N3 patients. Uh, as I told you before, uh, if there is a contralateral hyalur or interlobal uh, left node positivity, the patient should be staged as N3 or supraclavicular lymph node positivity or scalene lymph node positivity should be uh, named as uh, N3. If there is a, a a higher lymph node, uh, po positive higher lymph node, uh, such as suprajugular lymph node, it should be uh, staged as uh, M1 uh, rather than N3. So PET-CT is very helpful actually. It shows tumor and nodal involvement, but there is a caveat, there is a problem with that. As you see here in this patient, there is a tumor and also there are N3 and N2 lymph nodes. But as you see here, there is a halo around the lesions and the lymph node. This is because of a phenomenon uh, 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 which was de described by uh, uh, physicists. Actually, there is a phenomenon caused by uh, annihilation. Uh, in, during PET-CT, we don't assess the positron uh, uh, positron emission. Actually, we use FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, which is tagged with uh, radioactive fluor atom, which emits uh, positrons. But uh, there are very few number of detectors that detect positrons. Instead of detect, uh, detection of positrons, we detect uh, gamma rays. But in order to emit gamma ray, positrons should be annihilated with electron. There is a problem with that because atoms are 99.999999% empty uh, structures. Actually, we are we, uh, composed of empty uh, atoms. Uh, for this reason, a positron should travel at least six to eight millimeter to meet an electron to be annihilated. For this reason, uh, around the tumor, there is a halo, positive 
uh, a cloud uh, a cloud which shows the positivity around tumor and around uh, nodules so uh, we should ask does it make any difference it makes a difference because one centimeter me sometimes uh, is very important around this area if the lymph node is if the lymph node is n1 or n2 because one centimeter uh, distant from this area uh, this lymph node should be named as or uh, staged as n2 but hyaluronic lymph node uh, is staged as positivity is staged as n1 so for this reason if we see n1 lymph nodes uh, on pet ct there is a high possibility actually more than 60% of possibility for having N2 uh, positivity. So this is a problem uh, related to subatomic uh, phys physics, physics. So what is the post-predictive value of PET-CT? Unfortunately, it is uh, like uh, tossing a coin. It's about 60%. And negative predictive value is about 75% depending on the pretest probability. If there are many, many lift node positivity shown on PET CT, positive predictive value is higher, 90%. But if uh, the tumor is smaller, the negative, the positive predictive value uh, and positive negative predictive value decreases at a great extent. For example, this patient was one of ours. Uh, she was 41 year old female. PET CT shows high level leaf node metastasis, as you see here, but it turned out to be uh, that uh, turned out to be uh, positive mediastinal leaf nodes, multiple positive mediastinal leaf nodes. This patient uh, was a 71 year old female. PET CT uh, shows that there are multiple N2 disease, but after mediastinoscopy, we did, uh, it. Uh, 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 we showed that there, there, is, there was no lymph node positivity in this patient. So T1 tum in T1 tumors, uh, we should or we can trust the negativity of PET-CT. We shouldn't trust the PET positivity uh, unless the tumor invades mediastinum uh, and un unless the, the, the lymph nodes are bulky and positive. Uh, and if the tumor is T4 tumor, the uh, accuracy is about 70%. And in all tumors, the accuracy is about 76 to 85%. So which, in which tumors we should trust, we should depend on PET-CT. Only we should uh, trust T1 tumor, we should trust PET-CT when there is a peripheral small T1 tumor uh, without mediastinal FTG avidity. So this shows ESTS. This shows the ESTS guidelines, which summarizes what uh, I have uh, told about the staging. Uh, as you see here, uh, if there is a small peripheral tumor without any lymph node positivity on PET CT, uh, no media, preoperative mediastinal staging is necessary. If there is clinical N1 or if the tumor is larger than three centimeter, EBUS, EOS, if available, should be performed first, or video mediastinoscopy uh, is performed, should be performed. And if there is lymph node, there is, the, the lymph nodes are negative, mediastinal lymph nodes are negative, surgery uh, can be performed. If there is a mediastinal lymph node positivity on PET CT, should we uh, send the patient to uh, oncological treatment? The answer is no. We should uh, require uh, tissue, tissue confirmation. If we have EBUS or EOS, uh, we should uh, perform it. EOS is very rarely performed. It is performed for number nine lymph nodes, usually, or number eight lymph nodes can be reachable by EOS. Mediastin, if the mediastinal lymph node is positive, multimodality treatment is recommended. If uh, there is a negative lymph node, uh, even the fact that the PET CT is positive, should we uh, uh, go on with the surgery? No, we should uh, video. We should do video mediastinoscopy. If the mediastinal lymph nodes are negative, 
uh, we should go on to surgery. So let's look at the mediastinal staging modalities uh, one by one. EBUS tBNA actually fundamentally is a kind of uh, high technology uh, fiber optic bronchoscopy with a, uh, as you see here, with, with a channel uh, which is designed for a needle. And there is a, uh, there is a ultrasonography probe here in order to see the leaf node and in order to discriminate the leaf nodes from the pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein or aorta. And uh, bronch bronchoscopists can uh, uh, describe the lymph nodes very clearly with the aid of the, uh, the, uh, mid uh, the ultrasonography. And it is an, of course, a biopsy method, not a dissection method. Uh, and these lymph nodes can be biopsied with this needle. Uh, but mediastinoscopy, as it was shown uh, in the ESTS guideline uh, is the gold standard. Uh, it, the mediastinoscopy is started with a small incision, suprajugular incision, three centimeters suprajugular incision. Uh, after the dissection of the paratracheal fascia, mediastinoscopy is placed just below the uh, paratracheal fascia. If you can dissect this paratracheal fascia, it becomes a very uh, safe, and, uh, uh, and the uh, straightforward operation. And of course, during the last 20 years, we use video mediastinoscopies, and we usually, as a, uh, as a uh, preference, we do video mediastinoscopy and or video assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy, which means dissection of all mediastinal lymph nodes bilaterally uh, with the aid of video mediastinoscopy. If uh, in theory and in practical, uh, uh, in, in practice, if we dissect whole leaf nodes, uh, it is possible to reach almost 100% of accuracy. Of course, it is a theoretical possibility. Uh, usually, VAMLA uh, can help to reach about six, uh, 96% of accuracy. So of course, uh, whole leaf nodes can be dissected as you see here, and number two R, two, four R, 10, it is possible to reach uh, number 10. Even uh, you can reach number eight, paraesophageal leaf nodes, and it is possible to clear whole para, uh, para, uh, subcranial area. And of course, four L and two L uh, uh, left paratracheal leaf nodes can be dissected completely. So this video shows a short clip uh, of VAMLA. This is paratracheal area uh, and trachea. If you, if you, you didn't uh, open it, you have to open before you uh, place the uh, video mediastinoscope. As you see here, it is a straightforward procedure to take all mediastinal leaf nodes actually uh, it becomes easy, easier to dissect the leaf nodes during the thoracotum or VATS resection if you do this because uh, bilateral mediastinal leaf node dissection is possible with VAMLA. So what is the mortality or morbidity of this uh, procedure? Uh, as, as a short answer, very low. Morbidity is about 2% you, owing to usually uh, temporary uh, dysphonia. Uh, approximately uh, 12 years ago, we lost one patient during for, for because of this operation, and accuracy is about 95 percent. Of course, this includes uh, video mediastinoscopy and video assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy. And there is one more uh, mediastinal staging procedure, which is called anterior mediastinotomy. Uh, or uh, it is called Chamberlain procedure. It should be performed for the left uh, mediastinal leaf nodes, namely number five or number six leaf nodes. So it starts with a small incision again, just onto the uh, uh, second rib, as you see here. Uh, it, is a, it is your preference to re resect the second rib, or you can, uh, you, uh, you can leave the second rib and you can 
uh, go down to the second trip, taking only uh, uh, par uh, the uh, uh, parietal pleura. But uh, one should be very careful in order not to open the parietal pleura, as you see here. Uh, mediastinal pleura should be open. And these are the lymph nodes uh, from subarctic uh, area, uh, number five area. And these are the uh, uh, anterior mediastinal leaf nodes, which are number six leaf nodes. Uh, here, you can see these leaf nodes very clearly. There are many locations for these leaf nodes. Uh, it means that uh, if you, uh, you are obsessed to <laughs> dissect these leaf nodes like us, uh, you should lo look at these areas, all these areas. Extended mediastinoscopy can be performed uh, the advantage of extended mediastinoscopy is that you can use the same incision with the mediastinoscopy incision. And after the uh, performing mediastinoscopy uh, and uh, sending the leaf nodes to the frozen section analysis, if the leaf nodes are negative, you can go on to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, taking biopsy from number five or number six area. Of course, it should be performed in the left-sided tumors with the uh, 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 FTG positivity on uh, number five and or number six areas. So it shouldn't be performed in the patients with calcified uh, aorta. Video thoracoscopy is the, the last method to evaluate the uh, leaf nodes before the operation. Uh, this video shows uh, dissection and biopsy technique that can be used in the uh, patients with right-sided tumor. If you didn't or you don't want to perform mediastinoscopy, it's a good method to take biopsy before the operation. This area is upper paratracheal area, number four and number two leaf nodes. This area just above the uh, brachiocephalic vein here, it's number two, upper right paratracheal. Lastly, but very importantly, M factor uh, is one of the components of the TNM staging system. M0 defines uh, a tumor without metastasis. M1, M1A means uh, there are uh, pleural or pericardial or contralateral lung metastasis. M1B should be used for single ex extrathoracic metastasis. And if there is multiple extrathoracic metastasis, it should be uh, staged as M1C either multiple metastases to same organ or solitary metastases to multiple organ means M1C. So this is my last slide. Uh, TNM, when you uh, uh, reach, the, when you define T and an M factor, a TNM staging uh, is, should be constructed with using TNM factors, as you see here, T1A, T1B, T1C. These uh, T T1 uh, uh, parameters with, without no nodal involvement uh, 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 means that these are the stage 1A tumors. Uh, stage 2 uh, tumors are the tumors with M1 involvement. Uh, TN2 involvement uh, in, in means uh, 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 the, uh, the tumor, if the tumor is T1A, T1B, T1C, T2A, T2B, these tumors are T3A. If there is an uh, ipsilateral mediastinal involvement in a patient with T3 tumor or T3, T4 tumor, the uh, staging should be T3, T3, T3B. And these tumors, 3B, 3C, 4A, 4B tumors are categorically inoperable tumors. But of course, uh, there are uh, some uh, 
the the uh, treatment modalities and multimodal modalities for the some selected patients. Thank you very much for attention. These are the uh, 3B, these are the uh, survival rates of the tumors. This is why I uh, told you that uh, 3B, 3C tumors and 4A tumors are not candidates for operations. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Akif. Uh, Professor Tuna, this was just an amazing talk. Uh, this is a very difficult topic, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, the things changing uh, every so often with from seven to eight. So it is difficult for the youngsters to keep up with the, what is the changes. And thank you very much for eliciting everything very clearly and explaining to the youngsters how to go down the TNM stages. I'm going to start with question answers. Are you okay with that, Akif? Uh, what we'll do is we'll stop yes, sharing your screen and we'll bring you uh, your video onto the forefront. So just stop sharing your screen. Yeah, excellent. So let me just bring you up on the forefront and we'll ask you some questions. Uh, you're looking different today, Akif. Uh, sure. Haircut. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the uh, I should switch on the light. Switch on the light. We like to see your face. <laughs> yes. <That's right. laughs> Excellent. Okay. Uh, thanks, Akif. Uh, I'm going to ask start with a few questions. Uh, if that's okay with you, are you okay for time? Yes, sure. Akif? All right. Yes. Yes. Sure. Uh, sure. My, my no first problem. question is: Could you once again clarify? What are the changes to the current TNM as opposed to the previous TNM? So which okay. were the specific points that changed from the seven to eight? Okay, uh, there are a number of points actually. First of all, it, uh, let's start with T1. Uh, yeah. there, it, according to seven TNM staging, there was T1A and T1B, but okay. today, we have T1A, which means the tumor uh, smaller than one centimeter. T2B, T1B, uh, the tumor between one and two centimeter. And T1C, yeah. between two and three centimeters. So uh, before, according to 7 TNM uh, staging, uh, uh, the size uh, didn't matter in terms of a T3 tumor uh, and T a T4 tumor actually. T4 tumor today is a tumor uh, which is greater than seven centimeters. There was no definition before that. Uh, and also uh, uh, the definition for T3 was five centimeter today. If between five and seven centimeter, uh, the tumor should be uh, staged as T3. Uh, but in terms of uh, elastic lamina uh, or parietal pleural invasion, it was this, it is the same today. According to seventh staging, if the tumor uh, is on the, uh, near the carina, which is uh, in two centimeter distance uh, uh, from carina, it uh, used to be called as T3. But today, uh, the, the tumor should be uh, staged as T2 if in on it's on the the, uh, the uh, main bronchus, and uh, uh, also the, the there are some uh, uh, T factors that are removed from the uh, staging system. Uh, the first one is uh, T3. The second one is uh, mediastinal invasion. If the, uh, the tumor uh, invades media, only mediastinal pleura. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, uh, mean any different uh, T factor. Uh, but if it invades a, a major uh, structure, such as vena cava superior, as I showed you, or main uh, intra uh, pericardial pulmonary artery, or aorta, or vertebral body, it should be named, uh, staged as T4. And also, uh, uh, according to seventh staging system, the tumor 
if the tumor invades uh, diaphragm, it uh, was uh, it used to be uh, staged as T3, but today it should be staged as T4 uh, rather than uh, T3. And also, uh, pericardial effusion uh, was uh, staged as T4 uh, according to st seven staging system, but today it should be uh, staged as M1A rather than uh, uh, T4 uh, because uh, these patients uh, have uh, worse survival, uh, which are very similar survival, similar survival to the patients with metastasis. And also uh, in terms of M1 uh, uh, stagings, uh, according to seven staging system, there was no three staging uh, M1 staging, M1A, M1B, M1C. Uh, today, uh, we, if there is one extrathoracic metastasis, uh, we should uh, stage as M1B. If there is more than one extrathoracic metastasis, it should be uh, staged as M1C. These are the main differences uh, between seventh and eighth staging system. So let me come back to you and ask you a very basic question. Why were these changes made? I mean, it was already confusing, and now we've yeah. got more stages. So why were these changes made between 7th and 8th? What is the clinical okay. impact of this? And this is very important. So uh, there is very uh, weak uh, uh, point uh, about uh, lung cancer. Actually, if, if when we look at other uh, staging systems, uh, staging, usually staging, uh, uh, naming the staging, uh, every stage uh, could predict survival uh, of the patients at an accuracy of 95 or 90 percent. So uh, in a statistical uh, figure, uh, the R factor is about 0 0.9 or 0 0.7. But for the seventh staging system, during the seventh staging system, it, it used to be about 0 0.7. It means that only 70% of patients, uh, the, only, the survival could be predicted in only 70% of patients uh, accurately. So the uh, question for the eight staging system is that, uh, could we predict survival more accurately? So this is why, uh, one more than 100,000 patients data were recorded in order to uh, evaluate uh, or and the create eight staging system and this is why some of the t factors are uh, become uh, have become more detailed uh, some of the uh, m factors uh, have become more detailed m factors it, even the even with these uh, differences, with these changes, uh, even uh, I, 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 SLC used more than one hundred thousand patients. Today, the prediction factor is about only eighty percent. It is lower than that of um, breast cancer, or colon cancer, or melanoma. It is lower than most of the cancers. This is why other histopathological factors may be uh, used for TNM factor, but TNM is strictly anatomical definition. This is why uh, today we don't tend to use histopathological or host factors or environmental factors. Uh, but there are some tumors in which other factors are used for TNM staging such as uh, breast tumor. So this is why it became a little bit more complicated. Uh, but if you look at uh, the staging uh, table uh, carefully, and if you focus uh, this table, it becomes actually clearer and clearer, but it takes time. Sure. Now the next clinical scenario is uh, a tumor with a nodule in the same lobe 
yes. and a nodule in the other lobe on the same side, ipsilateral. Yes. So that's yes. changed as well. So tell us about that. Uh, a tumor, primary tumor, with a nodule yes. in the same lobe, and a primary tumor with a nodule in another lobe on the same side. What is the implication? Okay, so uh, if there is a tumor in the, uh, the, the tumor in the same lobe, the other uh, nodule in the same lobe, it should be the staged as T3. But if it is in the other lobe, it should be staged as T4. But there is a, a, a difficulty uh, for defining this because a nodule, uh, for example, there, you have a patient with one tumor, three centimeters, say, for, uh, and one centimeter. The, if the nodule is, the, the pathology of the nodule is different from each other, I mean, if you have a right upper lobe tumor, adenocarcinoma, and if uh, you have a right lower lobe tumor, for example, squamous cell carcinoma, we should use the highest a T factor, which is T2 or T3. But if pathology, if it is uh, uh, proven that uh, one nodule is a metastasis of the other nodule, which it is almost impossible in terms of uh, molecular biology uh, and the pathology, if one tumor is supposed to be metastasis of another, it should be staged as T4. Uh, if there are uh, same, the, 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 the nodule pathology is the same as the, the main tumor. And uh, we have, uh, actually we had a patient with three tumors at the same lobe, and three tumors were, uh, had different uh, histopathologies. And we call them, uh, T1 tumor because every one of one every tumor uh, was T1 tumor T1A T1B and T1B tumor. So if your pathologists say that these tumors are definitely different from each other, you sh we should uh, use uh, T factor for each tumor. But if there is a suspicion of having being a metastasis of, from one another. Uh, there is, the, 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 the tumor should be staged as T3 uh, if the nodule is in the same lobe, and if, or T4 if the nodule is in the other lobe. If the tumor is at the, uh, the contralateral lung, it should be uh, uh, staged as M1A because okay. uh, it is an uh, extra hemithoracic metastasis on the okay. contralateral side. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So it's very clear that tumor in the same, a second nodule in the same lobe is T3, a second nodule on the same side, but another lobe is T4, and a second yes. nodule on the other side is M1. Thanks for that. Yeah. Now, another yeah. question I'm going to ask you. Now, I'm asking you these questions on behalf of the students. So the second, sure. the next question I want to ask you is, you said that pericardial effusion is M1 according yes. to the new M1A. Guideline. Yeah. So what is pleural effusion? How do you categorize pleural effusion? Again, you know, uh, M1A. Pleural effusion is M1A. Okay. So pleural is also M1A and pericardial is also yes. M1A. Okay. Now, yes. next question is coming from the audience. They just want to know, you spoke about PL1, PL2, PL3. Uh, and, and you said that PL2 and PL3 are P3 disease. Just quickly go through what is PL0 and PL1? Is it T2 or is it T3? I mean, what, what, there's a bit of confusion there. Yes, uh, if there is a PL3, it is definitely uh, uh, PL3 or PL2. Uh, it is definitely uh, T3. So if it is, uh, if the tumor invades uh, visceral pleura uh, with, or parietal pleura, it should be uh, staged as T3. But if it doesn't invade visceral pleura uh, as PL1, uh, it doesn't, if it doesn't invade the elastic lamina, it should be PL1 or PL, PL1. It sh uh, and again, uh, the definition should be T2A or T2B. 
depending on the size of the tumor. So what if you've got a six centimeter tumor with PL1? What do you say is that? Uh, if it is six centimeter, uh, it should be uh, named as T3 because okay, six centimeter so is lar uh, larger than five centimeter. Five centimeter. So obviously. the primary size is more important than the PL differentiation. Yes. So what you're saying is if it was a four centimeter tumor and it invaded the parietal and the visceral pleura, then it becomes T3, correct? Yes, correct. So, so ideal definition for T3 is five to seven centimeters. But any, yes. even if the tumor is less than five centimeters, but it is invading the parietal or the visceral pleura, which is PL3, then it becomes a T3 yes. rather than a T2. Is that correct? It's just for the audience. I'm clear. Yes. Back. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and sometimes uh, even one, one centimeter tumor can invade PL3, can invade uh, parietal pleura. I see. And that becomes, becomes a PL3. T3. And it becomes a T3, yes, T3 rather T3. than a T1. Okay. Fantastic. T1, that's, yes. that's excellent explanation. I really love that part. Okay. Uh, another question has come from uh, Dr. Yaldo. Uh, she's asking if there is pleural and pericardial effusion and the first cytology comes negative, how many times should you resend cytology be before excluding it from being M1? Uh, actually, uh, it depends on your uh, uh, pathologists or cytopathologists. Actually, they say uh, if you have an uh, experienced cytopathologist at your institution, uh, two times is enough, actually. Uh, it, ten years ago, uh, they said that because of there, because there were two uh, papers uh, uh, citing this, that they said, uh, please take uh, as much uh, pleural effusion as possible. Usually be used to uh, drain whole uh, pleural fluid. Uh, and uh, we used to send 1,000 milliliter of pleural fluid or 1,500 milliliter of pleural fluid in order to increase the accuracy. But uh, today, uh, cytopathologists uh, usually uh, does, don't require a large volume of uh, fluid. And uh, if you send two, two times the 50th milliliter of tumor is pleural effusion, it is enough to say that it is not M1A. And sometimes if you have a suspicion that you didn't uh, take your uh, pleural fluid from the uh, main site, I mean, sometimes the pleural effusion uh, becomes loculated. And uh, in a patient, sometimes uh, some, there are some small loculations uh, that are not representative of the pari uh, uh, pleural effusion. And you, it is possible to use video thoracoscopic uh, sampling or um, sometimes a, a ultrasonography is helpful to take a large amount of our main uh, uh, space that contains the pleural effusion. So it is, you, you should be very careful about the, the location that you take from, take the uh, pleural fluid from. Okay, so basically the message you're giving out to the audience is that radiological appearance of pleural fluid does not mean it is M1. It is yeah. cytopathological Definitely. confirmation that is needed before you can call it M1. Yes. You can yes, get a, 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 an, a sympathetic effusion uh, in the presence of cancer, which may not be a malignant effusion. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This is called paramalignant effusion, not malignant effusion. Okay. So paramalignant and malignant. So there are two different malignant types. Effusion. So one yes. which you prove cytopathologically that this is malignant is a malignant. And one that is yes. not proven cytopathology is not a malignant effusion. So this patient should malignant. be treated as the primary size of the tumor. So if it is a T2, you should call it T2 and then operate on the patient. Okay. Yes. Uh, another question is, can you operate on anybody with 3B? 
3B, no. Uh, if there is, is there a, any role for surgery in 3B at all? I don't think so, actually. If you have a, a carino uh, tumor, T4 tumor with uh, lymph node positivity, uh, if uh, a multidisciplinary team uh, concludes uh, neoadjuvant therapy plus uh, uh, surgery, it, may, it can be done. It, it depends on the neoadjuvant, uh, your multidisciplinary team. But usually, as uh, I showed you the uh, the curves, uh, survival curves, these patients uh, should be referred to oncological therapy because Pacific trial, recently Pacific trial showed that these patients can have a uh, approximately 45% of five-year survival uh, with neo uh, uh, definitive chemoradiotherapy plus immunotherapy. So I don't think that uh, there is a role for surgery in 3B patients. Okay. What but about stage four uh, patients? It's different. If there is a solitary metastasis, you know, and if there is no mediastinal leaf node positivity, uh, and if the solitary metastasis is resectable, uh, okay. after the uh, metastasectomy, solitary metastasectomy, such as uh, adrenalectomy or cranial metastasectomy, one can perform. Uh, uh, tumor resection, lung tumor resection. Okay. What is the role of PNM staging for in situ carcinomas? T in situ carcinomas? Do yeah, actually, I, yeah, I didn't talk about that. Uh, in situ carcinomas uh, should be uh, staged as TIS, uh, in situ carcinoma. And there is a very uh, strong a discussion going on, on on this subject actually. So I am a member of, as you said, uh, nice to thank you very much uh, for the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I am the member of uh, ninth staging committee and uh, some of the uh, surgeons and uh, pathologists uh, argued about naming inside the carcinoma as non-malignant tumor. Because uh, when you, we look at the uh, literature from uh, Asian countries, from Japan especially, uh, the five-year survival is about 100% for the patients with inside the carcinoma. And also it is true for the patients with purely lepidic adenocarcinoma, which is minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, which is uh, uh, staged as T. MI, minimally invasive carcinoma. So these carcinomas are uh, small carcinomas, smaller than one centimeter, and there should be no invasion around, uh, around tissue. Uh, it is one step ahead of uh, inside the carcinoma, but the survival is almost same, about 100%. This is important because uh, these are the probably patients who can are who are candidate of uh, sublobar resections, segmentectomies. So usually, you know, uh, lobectomy is the, the, the preferred resectional resection type, but these patients can have a segmentectomy uh, because of the uh, high survival uh, rate. Okay, the next question is about invasion of the diaphragm. Uh, yes. You mentioned about T2 and T4. Just, just explain mm -hmm. that again, please. What, what is the invasion of diaphragm, and do you, is it partial invasion or complete invasion across into the abdomen? What is the difference? Yeah. First, I have to say that a tumor uh, usually doesn't involve uh, medias, uh, diaphragm. So, uh, in my professional life. Uh, there were many tumors actually uh, that were said to uh, invade diaphragm. But after resection of the diaphragm and the tumor, uh, many of those uh, 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 turned out to be non, uh, in, in, uh, not, uh, not invading diaphragm. So invading diaphragm uh, used to be staged as T3, according to seventh staging system. But uh, 
when the committee analyzed the yeast tumors, uh, I think very small number of tumors were analyzed. Uh, it, uh, the survival rate was very low. So the, it, the, this is why they changed the state, uh, T factor from T3 to T4. Uh, when you, again, uh, when, I, uh, when I answer your question, what is uh, the involvement of diaphragm? The, the diaphragm is deemed to be involved if the tumor involves uh, muscle fibers. If the pathologist uh, describes the muscle fiber involvement, which is very rare, as I told you, uh, it, 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 is, it should be staged as T4. But if, as you know, there is a layer, parietal pleural layer, just onto the diaphragm. So if the tumor invades only the, uh, the parietal pleura, which uh, is the, the case in most uh, of the patients, it should be at stage, stage T3, uh, T3, sorry, T3, so not T4. Uh, but okay. the diaphragmatic muscle invasion should be T4. Uh, actually, if fundamentally, if the tumor invades uh, diaphragmatic uh, muscle, uh, it practically invades actually subdiaphragmatic area, which is actually uh, fundamentally intra-abdominal area, just above the uh, peritoneum. So this is why probably these patients' uh, survival uh, were found to be very low. So it should be uh, the pathological pathology reports should be. Uh, uh, examined very carefully in order to show uh, uh, fiber invasion. So pathologists should define fiber invasion, uh, muscle fiber invasion. So just to repeat for the audience, if the pleura over the diaphragm is involved, it is T3. And yes. if the muscle of the diaphragm is involved, it's T4, correct? Yes, yeah, correct. Okay, so now next question is a nice question. They are asking about uh, uh, oligometastasis. So they are talking about a uh, tumor in the right upper lobe with an N1 yes. node and a solitary brain metastasis in the fat. What is yes. the, uh, you know, what is the next step in this management? Uh, so, uh, so Solitary brain metastasis with the tumor. Yeah, solitary brain, a tumor in the uh, right lung, upper lobe, say, with an N1 yes. disease and a solitary brain metastasis on PET. Or MRI, actually, that's what they meant. Solitary brain metastasis okay. on MRI. MRI. Okay, so usually uh, MRI is very sensitive for solitary brain metastasis in, uh, the, the, in cranium or adrenal. So the first step is to understand if there is a or there is only one solitary metastasis in the brain or adrenal. Uh, uh, if this metas if there is only one, or sometimes even the fact that the patient has two or three metastases, uh, these metastases sometimes can be uh, treated by neurosurgeons, resections, or sometimes SPRT because SPRT is very effective against uh, solitary brain metastasis and sometimes three or four metastases. I had a patient with uh, four metastases, four cranial metastases, and these metastases were ablated uh, with the use of SPRT. If these metastases can be cured, can be resected or ablated by SPRT, uh, mediastinoscopy should be uh, performed first, if you have EBUS tBNA uh, at your institution, EBUS tBNA should come first. And e mediastinoscopy is preferred, should be uh, performed because uh, we have to be sure that the patient has me no mediastinal leaf node positivity. And after being sure that the patient has no N2 or N3 disease, the tumor uh, can be resected the metastatic tumor can be resected or ablated, and then uh, it is possible to uh, resect the pulmonary tumor. 
sometimes uh, if the surgeons are available, uh, the adrenal tumor and uh, pulmonary tumor can be resected at the same time, uh, same session. Uh, but N0 uh, status is very important in these patients. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't make any sense to perform a resection. It could be seen as paradoxic because uh, we are okay with performing M1A, M1B patient, but we are seeking for N0. But uh, many studies showed that uh, if you perform surgery for the metastasis and the pulmonary tumor in a patient with N2 or N3 disease, the survival rate, five-year survival rate is about 10 to 15 percent, which doesn't make any sense actually. But if you have a patient with N0 disease, with M solitary metastasis, it works actually. So, so the same patient, what yes. is the survival of a patient with a single nodule N0 and one oligometastasis in the brain, both operated? What is the five-year survival for this group? Actually, it, it, it depends on the, of course, the pathology uh, and the uh, tumor, but uh, it is uh, reasonable to expect about uh, 35, 40% of uh, five-year survival in okay. these patients, between 20 to 40% of survival in five okay. years. Fantastic. So it's worth doing these surgeries. Uh, yeah. Next but, question. Uh, if you, sorry, if, you, uh, if the patient uh, underwent a, a cranial surgery or SPRT, uh, usually it is recommended to, to perform whole cranial irradiation just yeah. after the resection. And usually, I, uh, as, as far as I see the patient with cranial metastasis, I send the patient to radiotherapy. And during the radiotherapy, I prefer to perform mediastinoscopy. And if uh, the mediastinoscopy is negative, uh, I say usually to the radiation oncologist that please perform uh, whole cranial radiation and then I perform, I prefer to perform uh, sectional surgery. Okay, fantastic. So the next question is, you discussed end staging and you yes. told us all about end staging. You mentioned right at the start, NX. What clinical situation is there when you will have an NX? Okay, thank you for this question because uh, it needs an explanation. So uh, NX is like a, uh, is like a, a head in the head in the sand. It's like an ostrich syndrome. So sometimes, <laughs> uh, if we if we don't like uh, mediastinal staging before the operation, and uh, if there is no lymph node sampling before the surgery, or if uh, the patient underwent resectional surgery, for example, if the, if the patient undergoes a lobectomy without any leaf node dissection, it should be uh, staged, uh, the patient should be staged at NX. Sometimes uh, I, we, we can have some PET-CT reports without any mention of leaf nodes, uh, mediastinal or hyalur leaf nodes. Uh, it, it happens uh, uh, from, it happens sometimes because uh, if the uh, uh, the PET CT is performed in a center in which there is no thoracic surgery or uh, lung cancer management. Uh, the report uh, sometimes uh, doesn't contain any information about uh, uh, lymph node uh, positivity. So NX uh, stands for a, a situation in which there is no evaluation radiological and or uh, surgical evaluation of leaf, leaf node uh, in a patient. If the patient uh, undergoes suboptimal leaf node dissection, such as one leaf node uh, sampling during the operation, it is okay to call it NX because we should dissect at least three leaf nodes 
uh, three lymph node stations, uh, ideally six lymph nodes from three lymph node stations during a, a resection or after the resection of a lung tumor. Yeah, so this point is very important. Thanks, Aki, for that. Because there are some people out there who do a lobectomy and don't bother with lymph node dissection. So yeah. the NX comes into that scenario where, you know, you've done a lobectomy and you've done no lymph node dissection. I have done a lobectomy and I've done lymph node dissection. If my N0 comes back as N0 in pathology, it's truly N0. But that surgeon's histopathology will also come back as N0 because there are no lymph node dissection. But that is not N0, it is NX. So that is the situation. Yeah. So excellent, yeah. very, very well explained. Now, next question, Akif, is uh, we, you know, we know metastasis is metastasis. It's got a bad outcome. Why have you confused it for everybody and made it into M1, A, B, C? What, what is the difference, uh, you know, for all these various uh, uh, further substaging of uh, metastasis, the M part of the TNM? Yeah, it's again because of uh, survival. So everything should be based on survival. Uh, we knew that uh, before this eight staging system, the patient's survival uh, rates were very variable. Uh, the, uh, some of the patients uh, had 40% of survival, as I told you before, because, uh, and they, were, they can be benefited from metastasectomy plus pulmonary tumor resection. And some of them uh, had five or three percent of survival in five years. So this is why uh, there had to be a subclassification of M1 uh, status. So this is why uh, now we have M1A, M1B, and M1C. Actually, from my perspective, uh, M1B, uh, M1C should be uh, divided into two. Uh, sub sub subgroups because today as surgeons uh, we performed operation for a tumor and plus one or two metastases so two metastases is called multiple metastases but I think two metastases could be different from three metastases and or more than three metastases because when we uh, come across a patient with two cranial metastases, uh, multidisciplinary team can say, okay, we, uh, it's okay to resect these metastases. And this is why I think it's, again, suboptimal <laughs> subclassification. But of course, it is a little bit, it seems a little bit uh, confused uh, or uh, complicated as it is. Uh, but the the short answer is survival. So every time uh, these subclassifications uh, have been based on survival uh, classifications, survival uh, differences. If there is no Thank survival you. difference, it shouldn't be different. Uh, it shouldn't be in the different uh, stage. Okay, fantastic. So that's very, very well, well explained. Uh, one question was, you, you, you beautifully mentioned about the positron emission and, and the difference it makes when you are talking about N1 and N2 with the halo around the tumor or halo yes. around the lymph node. Uh, the audience wants you to please just explain that once again, the concept of annihilation that you mentioned uh, during the PET scan. Okay, actually uh, I skipped one slide. Uh, if you allow me to show one yeah, sure. another sure. slide. Yeah, you'll have to share your uh, order to explain. For us. Okay. First, I want to should find the slide again. While you're looking for it, I, I just want to tell the audience that uh, okay. 
uh, don't don't send your question on chat because I can't keep looking at 10 places. Send it on Q&A. Uh, Rajesh Singh has sent a lot of questions on chat and I just realized that they are pending. So send your questions on Q&A and I'm, I'm quite happy to ask. Yeah, go ahead, Akhil. Okay, so the, the, uh, we have to uh, talk about the structure of atom. So uh, remember the uh, high school classes, uh, they taught us that there is a, a nucleus and there are electrons uh, around the nucleus. It is true, but uh, there is one uh, difference, actually. Uh, when uh, the, the, the atom is so empty uh, that if the uh, nucleus is like an orange, the electrons uh, is, uh, in, in this analogy, is like uh, spectators uh, around the football field. So the, the length of the football field is about 100 meters. So this is why uh, we call the, the atoms are defined as 99.99999999% uh, 99 99 empty. So uh, someone uh, made the calculation that if we extract whole uh, spaces, in seven billion people in the world, we can be squeezed in one sugar cube. So uh, this is how this is how we are so empty. So, but what is the implication of this? Uh, when uh, when we use positron emitting fluor atom containing a glucose molecule, a positron, a positron goes out from the nucleus, but a positron cannot meet an electron for trillions of trillions of atom. So usually, as a statistical calculation, usually positron travels approximately six to eight millimeters to find an electron and then to be annihilated and then to emit a gamma ray which is detected. This is why every lesion, when we look at lesion, we don't look at the positron emission. We look at the gamma ray emission, which is approximately eight millimeter distance from the tumor on leaf node. So this is why there is a halo just around the leaf node or the tumor. This is a pheno subatomic phenomenon. So it has nothing to do with the calculations. It has nothing to do with the, uh, the detector sensitivity or other things. And from 1000 years from this, uh, from today, uh, we will be maybe, talking about our uh, grandchildren and grandchildren will be talking about this phenomenon. So this is why when we look at N1 node uh, and the emission from N1 node, this emission could be from mediastinal leaf node because oh. this uh, distance sometimes is uh, shorter than eight millimeter or six millimeter. This is why we when we see N1 leaf node positivity on PET CT, we have to perform a mediastinal staging modality, EBUS, EUS, or mediastinoscopy. Uh, so this is why we see always halo around leaf node or tumors all the time. So if, of course, there is a tumor, there is a peripheral tumor without leaf node positivity, of course, there shouldn't be any convergence between the tumor and the leaf node. But uh, uh, here around uh, higher uh, structures or M1 node or N2 nodes, uh, we should be very careful uh, when we interpret this PET-CT positivity. Okay. Fantastic, that's, that's very clear actually, that concept. Okay, stop sharing and come back onto the main uh, screen, Professor Turna. And uh, we've got a few more questions. Are you okay for time? Yes, sure, sure. Okay. 
Uh, so, Dr. Rajesh Singh, who's a surgical oncologist, he's asking this question. It's a, it's a nice question. I like it. it. Says, when we do media stenoscopy, the specimen comes out in multiple small pieces, and there's a risk of microscopic spillage, similar to R1 resection concept. Does this cause upstaging of tumor? And if this is correct, this factor should be considered in staging. Yeah. Uh, during VAMLA, uh, video assisted mediastinoscopic lymphadenectomy, we resect leaf nodes uh, completely if it is possible. But of, yes, we uh, usually uh, take the biopsy piece by piece if it is not possible. We didn't see any one uh, spillage or recurrence around mediastinum. Uh, even the fact that we performed more than 1,200 VAMLAs. So uh, uh, we didn't see any one of them. Probably there is an uh, inherent uh, resistance to this uh, uh, spillage or tumor recurrence around mediastinum. So uh, uh, on the contrary, we have seen a higher survival rate uh, who had VAMLA before the surgery. So this is why we, I routinely prefer to perform VAMLA before the uh, resection on surgery. We didn't see any. So, so taking a media style lymph node piece by piece, there is yeah. no evidence to suggest that there is uh, uh, soiling of the tumor. Okay, thank you. No, and or so, there is no uh, evidence to say that it is uh, okay. upgraded. Upgraded, okay. Another nice question. Uh, two situations. Central tumor arising from parenchyma invading directly the carina. That's one. Versus primary tumor arising from carina. Are they both staged differently? Actually, by definition, they are staged T4. Uh, but maybe there is some uh, survival difference between two tumors. But uh, if the tumor invades carina, it should be staged as T4. Actually, if you uh, uh, want to find the logic behind it, uh, when the tumor goes into a carinal area, mediastinum, uh, there is a high possibility that this tumor can metastasize through the uh, lymphatic uh, network, uh, or they, it's a higher possibility that the tumor can metastasize in the uh, distant uh, organs. So uh, maybe there, there should be a difference. I, one of my friends actually uh, uh, has been looking for the definition of uh, the size of the tumor. Uh, he has been looking for the larger tumors, nine centimeter, 10 centimeter. And he is comparing these tumors with the uh, relatively smaller carinal tumors. And he said that the, the, there is a small survival difference between the larger tumors and the relatively smaller carinal tumors. We will see maybe in yeah, ninth so, edition, we will see. So, so at the moment, they are all T4. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Now, next yeah. question is when you were making, when you're working on the ninth edition and you're making draft for the TNM, do you take into consideration racial uh, or subcontinent survivals or, uh, you know, uh, different races? Is there an impact on survival? Because Asians are known to have EGFR mutations, which favors yeah. good prognosis compared to the West. Yeah, we'll see. Actually, there is one confounding factor. Uh, for the eight staging system, a, 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 among approximately one, more than 100,000 patients, 80% of the patients who had complete lymph node dissection came from Asian countries. So actually, practically, when we talk about the impact of N, N status, we are talking about Asian. It's <laughs> uh, so uh, when they look at the, uh, for, before the eight staging uh, system, uh, uh, eight staging papers were published, they looked at the uh, survival difference. 
and they found that Asian, uh, the, the, the patients from Asia uh, uh, survive longer. Right. So probably this is one of the reasons that the, 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 they survive longer because they had a, a more complete lymph node dissection. Uh, about, about the EGFR and the genetic mutations, yes. Uh, in the database of ninth staging system, uh, almost all uh, genetic factors that are uh, analyzed can be entered, including next generation sequencing. So if uh, you have a, uh, you, you are a, uh, an institution who can do next generation sequencing, you can enter more than 10,000 uh, genetic information into one patient. So if there will be a, enough uh, patient number uh, who had these large big data, uh, then there will be possible to look at these small or uh, large or haplotypal uh, differences in, in these patients. But there should be many, many more uh, tumors in order to, uh, to analyze small differences. Okay, last two questions, if that's okay. Very, very short question. Sure. Uh, the sure. second last question is, how common is sympathetic effusion without being M1? Uh, I don't know the number, but uh, we have a database that includes uh, more than 700 patients with plural effusions. We have been trying actually to, 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 to create a paper on that. Approximately, I think I would say uh, one third of the plural effusions uh, with, in, in the patients with known uh, malignancy. I mean, not uh, only the uh, lung uh, tumor, but with other tumors uh, are uh, non-malignant plural effusions uh, that, are co that can be called uh, paramalignant effusion, one third actually. So, okay. Uh, it is not recommended to to uh, stage the patient M1B when you see plural, plural effusion in a patient okay. with tumor. Thank you. It, 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 it happens more commonly in the patient with uh, uh, the over ovary tumor, especially, and also of course with uh, lung tumor. Of course, yeah. Okay. Uh, last question: uh, because you are in such a privileged position. Uh, you are part of the committee that's writing the ninth guidelines. Uh, we want you to give us a sneak preview, uh, of course, highly confidential, but uh, two questions. One is, when is the ninth edition likely to come out? And what are the major changes that we can look forward to in the ninth edition? Okay, uh, it's uh, one million. Uh, but but you don't have to tell me. You don't have to tell me. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, I, I, uh, I just... Uh, you know, for on behalf of the audience, I'm asking you this question. <laughs> okay, so the uh, uh, the database uh, committee actually uh, will end the data entry uh, in 2023, and ab about to, in 2025 and 2026. There will be new papers, and uh, expectedly, the ninth staging will be in effect in 2027. Uh, there are many changes uh, actually talking in these uh, uh, meetings. Uh, there are, of course, some confused areas. One confused area is uh, to define the tumor, part solid tumor uh, definitions. Uh, which uh, metrics should we use? Should we use, uh, should we uh, uh, measure the GGO areas with solid component? Should we uh, measure only the solid component? Sometimes the solid component uh, is not circular. It is uh, very uh, 
uh, irregular. There, there is a there is some uh, question uh, def definition. Uh, there are some uh, discussions about this. The other discussion uh, in pathological evaluation is about STAS, uh, so spread through airway spaces. So these are very interesting uh, uh, tumors. Uh, two prominent pathologists say that it is a fact, and the one other pathologist in the committee said that it is an artifact. There is no such thing as STAS. But uh, we know that from some papers, STAS is very important pathological factor. Uh, about uh, more definable T factors, I think mediastinal invasion should return uh, as, a, as a factor, uh, as an important factor. And uh, personally, I <laughs> insisted to, to uh, look at the simple cytopathological factors such as perineural invasion, lymphovascular invasion, and vascular uh, invasion. I think these uh, invasions, especially the lymphovascular invasion, is important in terms of uh, survival. The other uh, discuss this, uh, the thing that is that have been discussed is that uh, should we use should we create a subclassifications uh, according to number of lymph node positivity, uh, like in the case in uh, esophageal uh, tumors. So if we have two station positive N2 disease, it is, is it important, is it, uh, did these patients are, uh, uh, have worse survival? Uh, of course, uh, there, there, is, there are some papers uh, and uh, eight stage and committees suggest that multi the, uh, N2 disease is uh, worse than the single station N2 disease and uh, skip metastasis is better than no skip metastasis. But uh, the first of all, is it possible to validate these findings? And of course, we should use these uh, findings preoperatively. I mean, we have to uh, show this on the radiological examinations in order to use it uh, consistently. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the, uh, the the discussions that have been going on. And uh, lastly, but very importantly, uh, genetic factors. Uh, can be used, maybe, not probably with a, a component of TNM staging, but maybe they will be used as some accessory uh, staging uh, parameters. Uh, since it is almost not possible to use them before the operation, it is very uh, small uh, probability that we will use these uh, uh, factors, but there is a thing called liquid biopsy. So some of the uh, studies show that uh, lung, uh, sorry, blood uh, analysis can show some of the genetic factors uh, that are coming from the tumor. So maybe it will be possible to use some of the uh, genetic factors such as KRAS, EGFR, P53, BCL2 as an adjunct to, uh, to uh, TNM staging system. So uh, Dr. Asamura says, uh, once said, no change, no change, but I don't agree with him. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so uh, he, he, he explained the, the, his uh, idea, his uh, uh, opinion, but I don't agree with that because, uh, as I said uh, before, this staging is complicated, but it is still suboptimal. Okay. So, so to, uh, I think to conclude your uh, conversation, uh, you did say that the seventh staging was around seventy percent accurate if you put a yes, patient in, and now. Yeah. Now it's yeah. 80%. So we are trying to yes. actually increase that probability with the ninth yes. staging. And we are trying to include factors like liquid biopsy, 
uh, factors like uh, uh, straight through airway spaces uh, and uh, I think you're, you have suggested perineural invasion and perivascular uh, invasion, whether these factors make a difference to survival. Thank you yeah. very much, Professor because, Turna. Because yes. let, let me explain one thing. Yeah, yeah, can because you, can we you. have still we, we have still aha moments. For example, when we uh, operate a patient with T1A tumor, sometimes some of the patients can come to us with multiple metastases, and we say, "Aha, how could it happen?" And sometimes we uh, we were talking about operating a patient with N3 disease, and we happen to say that, no, it's important. The patient is important, not the stage. So this okay. means that the, the staging system is still suboptimal. So we have to de decrease the aha mo 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 moments and we have to make it as perfect as possible. Fantastic. Uh, Professor Tuna, this has been an absolute honor and privilege. I have to say, I, I am so privileged to sit and uh, you know, moderate this session with you. It's been a great learning experience for all of us on this forum. And we are extremely grateful to you for having given us the time and also given us an insight into your great knowledge about this subject. It is a complex subject. Uh, students uh, frequently struggle with the TNM staging, but I think uh, it will. it has been made absolutely clear by you during your talks and also the way you handled the question and answers was just immaculate. So once again, thank you very much and we are very, very grateful for your time. Uh, good night, thank Professor Turna, and good night to everybody else. I hope you, you had a good great night. session and you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Good night.